Hello, I'm Andrew Rizzoni, and this is Lesson 3 of our course on Economic Depressions. During the last two lectures, we saw how the U.S. current account deficit has been throwing off enormous quantities of dollars into the global economy and how those dollars have been accumulated as foreign exchange reserves by the central banks of the trade surplus countries. In this lecture, I'll explain what those central banks do with the dollars they accumulate. To be specific, I'll show that the investment of those dollars into U.S. dollar assets blew the United States economy into an economic bubble during the years leading up to the crisis. This chart shows the U.S. current account balance. It went from more or less in balance during the 1960s up to a deficit of $800 billion in, in 2006. Now, we've already seen how these trade deficits blew the trade surplus countries into bubbles, like Japan in the 1980s and Thailand and the other Asia crisis countries in the 1990s. In this lecture, we're going to take a look at how these trade deficit dollars boomerang back into the United States and blew it into an economic bubble as well. Now keep in mind that every country's balance of payments has to balance. So the bigger the U.S. trade deficit becomes, the bigger the capital inflows into the U.S. will also become. As you can see here, the larger the U.S. trade deficit, the larger the current account deficit became, the red bar, the larger the U.S. surplus on, the, on its capital and financial account became. The current account deficit has to be completely offset by the surplus on the capital and financial account. And in this chart, you can see that it was. Now, we've, we've seen this chart before, total foreign exchange reserves, $10.7 trillion. Now, these dollars were accumulated by foreign, foreign central banks in the trade surplus countries. The question is, what did they do with these dollars once they had accumulated them? And the answer is, they had to invest the dollars into U.S. dollar denominated denominated assets of one kind or the other in order to earn interest on the dollars. So that's what they did. Now central banks are conservative and they would prefer to invest their foreign exchange reserves into government bonds. So now we're going to take a look at the U.S. government's budget deficit to see just how many government bonds were sold each year. This is measured in billions of dollars. You can see going back to the 1950s, the budget deficit was not that large. Then in the 70s, it became considerably larger. In the 1980s, it became very large. And in recent decades, it's become enormous. So let's compare the U.S. current account deficit with the budget deficit. In this chart, there are two bars. The red bar represents the current account deficit and the green bar represents the government's budget deficit. Now I've flipped these numbers, these bars over. They're primarily negative numbers, but in order to make them easier to, to read and to, to understand, I've, made, I've flipped them over so they appear to be positive numbers. All right, now let's look at 2006. That was the year when the U.S. current account deficit was at its peak. It was $800 billion. So that, that meant that in 2006, foreign central banks accumulated $800 billion. And they would have liked to have invested those dollars into U.S. government bonds. But as you can see, in 2006, the green bar, the budget deficit, was only a little more than $200 billion. So in other words, foreign central banks could have accumulated, they could have bought up every new government bond sold that year and still had almost $600 billion left over that they had to invest in other dollar-denominated assets of one kind or another. So 
Going back to 1996, you can see here that the red bar was larger than the green bar for 12 years, from 1996 to 2008. The current account deficit was larger than the budget deficit. That meant it was very easy for the United States government to finance its budget deficits at very low interest rates because foreign central banks alone had enough demand, enough dollar reserves to buy every new treasury bond issued and they had a great deal left over to buy other dollar denominated assets. So what other dollar denominated assets did they buy? Well, they had a few choices. First, they could buy government bonds that had been issued in earlier years that were, at that point, owned by someone else. So that was one option. They could buy government bonds issued in earlier years. Or they could issue, they could buy debt issued by Fannie, and, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, or corporate debt, or stocks, or other US dollar denominated assets. So let's take a look and see what they, what they did do. All right, in this chart, there are two bars. The blue bar shows the increase in government debt outstanding every year from 1990 to 2001. It's more or less the same thing as the US budget deficit in those years, how many new government bonds were sold during those years. Now the red bar represents the amount of debt sold each year by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Let's take a look at 1996, 97, 98, 99, 2000. Well, at that point, the, the US economy was very strong and the stock market bubble was, was raging. So the US government had very high tax revenues and as a result of the surging tax revenues, the budget actually went into a surplus in 98, 99, 2000, and 2001. And so there were no new government bonds sold that year at all. In fact, the government was buying back and retiring government bonds that it had sold in earlier years. But remember, during those years, the US current account deficit was becoming very much larger meaning that other central banks were accumulating more and more dollars that they needed to invest somewhere. Well, there were no new government bonds being sold in those years, so what did they do? Well, this created a fantastic opportunity for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to expand their balance sheets by selling more debt. So notice between 1997 and 1999, Fannie and Freddie tripled the amount of debt they issued to $600 billion. And as they issued that year $600 billion of debt, they accumulated $600 billion in cash. And they used that cash to buy up mortgages. And by buying up mortgages, they pushed up the US property market. So that was the beginning of the property bubble in the United States. I was living in Washington, DC during those years, and the bubble was well underway then. If you wanted to buy a house, the very day that the for sale sign was put out in the yard, you had better make a bid on that house that very day and bid more than the asking price, or otherwise someone else would snap up that property. The property bubble was well underway, and this is the reason why. Now, in the next chart, two things change. First, we're looking further into the future, out to 2000 out to 2006. And then we've also added a new bar, the green bar. The green bar represents the debt issued by private sector issuers of asset-backed securities like Countrywide and IndyMac. All right, so let's see what happened. In 2001, the NASDAQ bubble popped and the US economy slowed down very sharply. Well, at that point, the US government's tax revenues disappeared. So the US government went back into a budget deficit and once again started issuing large amounts of government bonds. 
So you can see the blue bar increased to $200 billion in 2002 and to $400 billion in 2003. That represents the amount of new debt that the government was selling. So by 2003, the government's selling $400 billion of treasury bonds, but Fannie and Freddie are still selling nearly $600 billion worth of their own debt. So the government was actually having to compete with Fannie and Freddie to sell debt. Worse than that, the government by this point, the Treasury Department and the Central Bank, realized that all of the debt being issued by Fannie and Freddie and all of the cash that they were using to buy up mortgages, that was destabilizing the U.S. economy by creating the property bubble. So something had to be done to rein in Fannie and Freddie. The Treasury Department more or less teamed up with the Fed. They did some investigating and discovered that Fannie and Freddie had been manipulating their accounts using derivatives. So they fired the management of Fannie and Freddie and they prevented, they barred them from issuing any more debt. So you can see that the red bar fell off very sharply in 2004 to roughly $100 billion and to even less in 2005. But by that time, the U.S. economy was improving again because of the property bubble. The tax revenues were increasing. So the blue bar, the amount of government debt that the government was selling, started, starting, started to become less. But recall by 2006, that's the year the trade deficit in the United States, the current account deficit, peaked at $800 billion. So the foreign central banks were accumulating more dollars than ever before. And at that point, neither the government nor Fannie and Freddie were selling enough debt to absorb all of those dollars. So this created a fantastic opportunity for the private sector issuers of asset-backed securities like Countrywide and IndyMac to radically expand their balance sheets. You can see between 2003 and 2005 that they quadrupled their debt issuance to $800 billion. And altogether, between 2004 and 2006, they sold roughly $2 trillion worth of debt and obtained $2 trillion worth of cash. And with that cash, they bought up $2 trillion of subprime loans. During that period, they effectively hired tens of thousands of mortgage brokers to call up poor people and lend them money that they couldn't afford. And that created the subprime disaster. So, so what we've seen is that the U.S. trade deficit threw dollars off from the global economy. They were accumulated by foreign central banks and the trade surplus countries. Those central banks then reinvested those dollars into U.S. dollar assets uh, and blew the United States into a bubble between 1996 and 2008. Now, during this period, the Fed lost control over interest rates and lost control over the economy for, for the same reason. Once the economy started improving around 2004, the Fed started increasing the federal funds rate to try to cool it down and to try to cool down the property bubble. And between 2004 and 2006, the Fed increased the federal funds rate 17 times by a total of 425 basis points. Now, normally, when the Fed moves up the federal funds rate, then the 10-year Treasury bond yield also moves higher. And that's the most important yield because mortgage rates are measured against the, the government bond yield, the risk-free yield. But this time, even though the Fed increased interest rates again and again at the short end of the yield curve, the 10-year government bond yield would not move any higher. And in congressional testimony, a senator asked Fed Chairman Greenspan why that was. He, he said, Chairman Greenspan, you've increased interest rates again and again, but the 10-year government bond yield refuses to move higher. Why is that? And Chairman Greenspan replied, he said, I don't know. It's a conundrum. But I believe he did know it was completely obvious what was going on. The U.S. trade deficit was so enormous by that point, $800 billion, the current account deficit hit in 2006. Foreign central banks were accumulating uh, that year, 
billion dollars in foreign exchange reserves and using that money to buy up not only newly issued government bonds, but government bonds that had been sold in earlier years as well. And when they bought up the bonds issued in earlier years, that pushed up their price and drove down their yields. And that caused the Fed to lose control over interest rates and to lose control over the economy. So the Fed had no ability to rein in the out of control property bubble. That blew the US economy into a bubble. And that pulled in, that allowed the Americans to refinance their homes and extract equity. That allowed them to consume more. So the United States then imported more from abroad. That allowed the, the rest of the world to export more. And this created an enormous global economic bubble. But in 2008, all of that debt couldn't be repaid by the Americans and the global economic crisis started. This all resulted due to flaws in the dollar standard. And that's what we'll discuss in the next lecture. After the Bretton Woods system broke down in 1971, a new international monetary system began to take shape. I call it the dollar standard because it's built around US dollars as the key international reserve asset. The principal flaw in the dollar standard is that, unlike the gold standard or the Bretton Woods system, it lacks an automatic adjustment mechanism to prevent trade imbalances between nations. Over the past four decades, those imbalances have grown to an enormous scale and destabilized the global economy. In this lecture, we'll consider the flaws of the dollar standard. This chart shows the US current account deficit. Now, historically, trade between nations had to balance. But once the Bretton Woods system broke down, the US quickly discovered that it could buy things from other countries and, and pay for them with paper dollars or government bonds denominated in paper dollars. Soon thereafter, the US started running enormous trade deficits. And US imports have fueled global economic growth now for decades. Nothing like this has ever occurred before in history where a large country has run such large trade deficits. As the US trade deficit grew larger and larger, it drove global economic growth. But then when the crisis started in 2008, the Americans couldn't repay the debt that they accumulated the current account deficit corrected and the global economic crisis began. So one of the flaws of the dollar standard is that it requires the United States to go deeper and deeper into debt to the rest of the world to drive global economic growth and prosperity. That's just something that is not possible and or sustainable over the long run. Now another flaw is that all of the surplus countries are blown into economic bubbles. Japan in the 1980s, the Asia crisis countries in the 1990s, and over the last 15 years or so, China. And by the way, Germany is more or less a, a variation on this theme. Germany has a very large trade surplus, but unlike Japan or China, Germany doesn't allow the trade surplus money to go into Germany. Instead, it takes that trade surplus money and lends it to Ireland, Greece, Portugal, and Spain, and it's blown them into economic bubbles instead. Now those bubbles have popped and Germany can't get the money back. So when the surplus money goes into the domestic economy, it goes into the banking system, and that causes very rapid deposit growth. And the rapid deposit growth forces the banks to have very rapid loan growth because they have to lend out the money in order to earn interest to pay interest on the deposits. And the rapid loan growth then creates economic, very rapid economic growth that creates the boom and every boom bust. But also, the deficit countries are also blown into economic bubbles as the 
deficit money re-enters their economies to finance the current account deficit. So that's what we've seen not only in the United States, but in England, Ireland, Portugal, Spain, and Greece. Because every country's balance of payments has to balance, when a country has a large trade deficit it, or, and current account deficit, it must also have very large capital and financial account inflows to make the balance of payments balance. And those financial inflows blow the country into bubbles, and the bubbles always pop. So why do countries bubble? It's the inflow of exogenous money that causes very rapid deposit growth and forces very rapid loan growth. The rapid loan growth fuels a, a credit boom that is always characterized by increased consumption, investment, and hiring, as well as asset price inflation. So an upward spiral of prosperity begins and it lasts so long as credit continues to expand. But unfortunately, the day always arrives when credit can't expand any further, and then the bubble pops. The boom always busts. Why is that? It's because the income of the public doesn't keep pace with the increase in production and asset prices. Eventually, Excess capacity causes falling product prices, falling profits, and corporate distress. The corporate distress then leads to systemic banking sector crisis. Meanwhile, the public can't afford to service the interest on the inflated asset prices, and they begin to default. This, too, leads to a systemic banking crisis. So just to, to repeat, the inflow of foreign money leads to rapid deposit growth, and that forces rapid loan growth. The rapid credit expansion leads to the expansion of industrial capacity. Corporations build more factories and expand their capacity. But soon, that leads to excess capacity and falling prices and falling profits and corporate distress. The excessive credit expansion also creates asset price inflation. And sooner or later, the asset prices become so inflated that the public doesn't have enough income to service the interest on the inflated asset prices, and they default. The crisis begins, and this ends in systemic banking crisis. We saw that in Japan, the Asia crisis countries, and more recently, globally, when the global economic crisis started in 2008. So what happens when a bubble pops? one of two things. Either there is a depression or there's a government bailout. And the bailouts include a bank rescue that saves the depositors, large budget deficits, and whenever possible, currency devaluation to boost exports. So in the 1930s, when the bubble popped, there was a depression. This time around the world, we've seen government bailouts and the government bailouts are still continuing. The US government has trillion dollar budget deficits every year, and these are financed by the creation of trillions of dollars of paper money creation. But don't you think there's something irresponsible about all this? And it's talked about, he's talking about, as a matter of fact, this is what happened, it's true. Like, uh, where are all the actors? overseas and here, what are they thinking? Why are they allowing this to go on like this? Yeah. Someone's doing fine. The, the Freddie, uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac people, Reigns, the guy was Edward Reigns, I think it was, was made a couple hundred million dollar salary. I mean, he, got, he took his money and ran. He didn't, they, no one indicted him, I think, in any serious way. So. Wasn't the Fed reaction here the same as 29 to 33, 34, and again to 37? Uh, in what way? Raising rates for a long time, etc. Well, I don't, I don't know about raising rates at the wrong time. I think.
by the time they did that in 1929, the, the bubble had, had already occurred and the bust was on it. Then they had to run right back down, try to lower rates, and it still didn't do anything. But we didn't have this export imbalance in 29 that we have today. You know, it was a little different mechanism. It was related. It was a, it was a printing of money during the war. First World War I that caused ultimately the problems in the Versailles Treaty where Germany couldn't pay it back, you know, fed into it. But the point is, this is a case of an imbalance that's laid out for you right here. And imbalances can occur in many ways, but it, 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 it occurred here. In Greenspan, he says he doesn't know what the hell's going on. I mean, we know what's going on. Greenspan doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't know this. He's the statistics that this guy's publishing are from Greenspan's shop. He doesn't know. Hey, because all his friends made money in Wall Street, and, and when it blew up, the, which Wall Street guy other than Bernie Madoff, who was robbing people outright, went to jail over any of this? Nobody. It blew sky high, everyone kept their money, and they've been refloated with taxpayer money up, right up to now, and the government's putting money in, not only refloated them, but it's basically putting the QA into the economy, but since there's no economy, relatively speaking, it goes right into the asset markets, and you've got a booming stock market and all that again. There's, there's no more economy left, really? Is that what you're saying? I'm sorry, that's relatively speaking. Of course there's an economy. Haiti, Haiti has an economy. So compared to the post-World War II yeah. era, we have no economy left. Well, well we had 50% of the production of the world in 1945. We probably have 28, 29, which is not bad, but a lot of that is financial services and paper shuffling and claims. In other words, the Romans didn't have an economy in the heyday of their empire, if you think about it. They started off with, you know, producing farms and soldiers. At the end of the day, they used to say in Rome, thousands of trucks came into the city with all kinds of the goods of the world. And what went out of those trucks was, was uh, horseshit. So we really have no productive economy left, relatively speaking. Um, we do, but relative to the amount of people we employ, we're only employing 10% of the population. So and all the subsidiary stuff is, is empire managing. Look, uh, in England's heyday of running an empire, uh, almost one third of the workforce of England, England had a powerful manufacturing center, you know, maybe 20% or 25%. But uh, almost a third of their labor force were, were, was domestic labor, working in households who were relatively wealthy. You know, but, but England didn't end up running the world manufacturing after World War II. You know, now they're a, they're a junior partner of us in finance. 25% of the GNP of England is in the London Financial District. So there's a few cities making money out of paper shuffling. And, 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 and cutting a piece of the claims that go across their desk, saying, I own this, you own that, we own it at gunpoint, we, we can set the terms of trade, you know. We're like Rome. Rome didn't have to produce anything at the end, it just, its production was legions, which went and said, you pay us or we kill you. So it's a good way to collect money, you don't have to be productive, you just have to be productive in your comparative advantage, which was legions. Ours is in military and finance. And Walmart isn't to feed, feed, you know, service poor people. And McDonald's feed poor people. Yeah, but Walmart is subsidized by, by taxpayers. Yeah, the, 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 the workforce is. Yeah, the yeah, they can't afford to pay them. They don't have to pay them. But, you know, a New Yorker who buys in Walmart is going to get a deal for a while. Who thinks it's a deal, but at the end he's paying. Well, it's a deal. See, I, I had a friend... Uh, who, who I worked with for many years, he well, was older than I, than I was. He grew up in the sweet spot of America. Everything worked out for him. Is he still alive? Is he still alive? Huh? Is he still alive? No, he died. But everything worked out. His investments worked out. He wasn't too particular. He, was, he, ran, he ran a printing department in, in our company. It all worked out. 
revolution or anything like that, problems, inequity, of all, never crossed his path. And to the day he died, it was all good. So, you know, you can get lucky. I used to point out, you know, Steve, don't you think something this, that, and this, I used to, you know, the social guy. Don't you think this and this? Eh? Problem. He said, I work two jobs and I saved a little money. I made money in the stock market. I got a house. I got a good job. I got kids. My kids are all educated. What's the problem? He, he died. Uh, he made his money, you know, he died maybe 10 years ago. Made his money before that. So a lot of Americans, you know, you know after World War II, Two, this country was on a huge upswing. We remember all of that. We look forward to a look at our kids. I look at my grandkids. I say, oh my God. And this is in a world where technology is supposed to make things more efficient. But the fruits of that aren't going to these kids. They have no bargaining power. They're not, they don't belong to anything. When the Union started asking for more money around the Vietnamese War and the conditions for exporting and free trade were better and internets and all that, they said, okay, we'll move the, stop moving the factories offshore. You want more money? We'll go to Mexico. We'll go to wherever. And they put the working American, working class, who was a beneficiary of the Roosevelt regulations to bargain and all that. And, went through World War II and got, you know, got decent jobs and pay. And by 1970, that was basically over. Oh, you don't wanna, you want more money and if you deserve more money. Next day, the factory's gone. Well, wait a minute, I thought I was gonna get money, more money. Well, yeah, you were, but. Uh, and then they moved them also to the south. Wherever. And then after that, mm. they moved south and Yeah. So. American people do not know how to defend their own interests in a complex world. Now, if you have a bright kid, right? if you have bright kids, and they're the smartest people in the class, they're going to do okay because the premium is on brains. So there's enough people in New York with, you've never met a middle class New Yorker whose kid wasn't a genius, right? Probably is. So these kids are all getting hired at the upper levels, so they're fine. The, elite, the Ivy League schools are producing the people getting the best jobs on average. And the kids are generally marrying kids from the Ivy League schools. And their kids get the benefit of all that, and they end up going to the Ivy League schools. Now, it's not perfect. I mean, I can, I can find a street peddler in New York who's got a son who's studying real hard and smart, and he's going to Harvard. And I can tell you, I can show you a hedge fund guy whose kid's too stupid to get to Harvard. So there's some slippage there, okay? But generally speaking, that's not the case. What's the fear of, oh, let's put it another way. If you know middle class people in New York, because middle class people in New York have to be better off than any place else, they may have to pay more money, but you make up for it in the cultural amenities. What's the one thing after the health of their children that they're universally concerned about education. education and his ability right if you have a kid that's stupid it's a tragedy because you know what it means but if you've got a kid that's super bright you know what that means you're not worried about is your kid does your kid have good character yeah you'd like that you're not worried about oh I want to I want to go to Dalton and get my kid in. He's not too bright, but he's got good character. No, well, yeah, we, we appreciate that, but you can't get in here. So after a while, they get the message. You know? he's, he has a good character, but he's good in art. He, he, he draws pictures. He's, he's got a lot of self-expression. He can't do math and physics or anything like that. Oh, that's wonderful. Send him to the village school, someplace like that. Yeah. Right? Is anyone running around New York bragging about their dumb kid? We ever see any dumb kid braggarts going around? It's always my kid is smarter than your kid, right? My kid did this, my kid did that. It's because the desperation is, because if they're not that way, 
what are they going to do? Now, the land tax and all that, it's all well and good because land is used as a, as a uh, basis for credit in many cases. But if I can go print enough money to buy all the land one shot in America, and from that point on, I pretty much trump that, didn't right. I? Let me give you an example of that, that thinking. I'm going to go back to the time of uh, Robin Hood, England, you know? And the peasants are working the land, and the nobles own the land, and they take half the things grown, and they do a little fighting and a little carousing. And the peasants are on in the fields all day working, you know, doing their thing. And this is, and, and, and the church says this is the order of the way things are. It's the divine right and all that. This is going on. You know, so the, pre the peasants raking his carrots for 100 years, 200 years, 300 years. He looks around, he sees some fat, wealthy churchmen and nobles. He's seeing wealth, people not working so hard. So after a while, I don't care how dumb he is, he cracks the code. This ain't good. So let's visualize he gets a bunch of his guys and he walks up to the castle and says, look, we know what you're doing. We're taking short money here. We're doing all the work. You're taking half of what we got, and you're living pretty good, and we, we, we don't really, we're not, we're not satisfied. We know what you're doing. Richard the Lionheart says, okay, you got it. Now, uh, go back to work, because if not, I'll send the army and I'll just cut your heads off and I'll get rid of you. But, but the point is made. He goes back to the nobles and says, look, this is not working. We got away with it. I can terrorize them now. They, before, they didn't figure it out. They thought it was God's will that they rake the carrots and, and give them up. And, you know, so they made peace with themselves. After a while, it was getting tough to take. Change was in the wind. There were some merchants coming from the Middle East with cloth and this and that. So well, I want to get some of that stuff. So there's change. <coughs> the nobles say, oh, my God. We're getting more and more of these peasant rebellions and upset. Then we get the Black Plague and we lose half our peasants and now these little sons of bitches want more money because it's supply and demand. Got to pass laws. You can't have bargaining all of a sudden because, you know, it's unfair now. So, but there's enough pressure on the system. So a couple of smart nobles say, look, let's, let's design a whole new system, make everybody happy. It's called capitalism. And here's how it works. Instead of you raking those carrots, and you got your 10 carrots here, and I come back and take three of them. I can see that. You got my carrots. Let's have capitalism. How that, how's that work? Here's what happens. Everybody goes back to work. All right? You now own your own piece of land. We give it up. And we meet every Saturday at a market. And what we have is we, uh, we have a little bidding market. You go in and you bring your chickens and carrots and this guy will trade you chickens and carrots and all of this. And pretty soon some guy says, well, you know, I can make it even better. We'll issue currency so that we can count the chickens and carrots easier. And we set up a market. You have to pay rent to for the stall, you have to pay rent to get in, and you do your trading, and you put your carrots in, no one's got a gun at you, no one's stealing them, you put your 10 carrots in, and you come home with two chickens and a, and a uh, fine little bracelet. So you come home to the old lady and say, look, I brought the carrots in here and I got this and this, you know? She says, okay, sounds good to me, you just traded, no one stuck a gun in your head, nope, 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 it's all free. Go back to the marketplace and see if you can get your, with what you've got here, you can get your original number of carrots back. 